Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Lorraine Garcia, Communications Specialist with the Coachella Valley Water District, and I'm happy to welcome you to our virtual workshop, cool, Planting Cool Season Vegetables. For this uh, presentation, everyone will be muted, so all participants are muted. So if you have any questions, please use the questions panel in the right-hand side near the chat box. Now let's get started. I will introduce our pre presenter. Angela Johnson is a water management specialist for the Coachella Valley Water District. In addition to holding a bachelor's degree in career and technical education, she also has an associate's degree in agribusiness. Throughout her career in water management, she has earned certifications as a water use efficiency practitioner, landscape irrigation auditor, golf irrigation auditor, a University of California Cooperative Extension Master Gardener, a desert naturalist. She is also a certified arborist. Angela is also qualified to perform tree risk assessments. And she is currently studying for a nursery management certification from Mount San Antonio College. Please welcome Angela Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to our first virtual workshop of the year. So this is pretty exciting. Also a little intimidating because this is all new for us, but uh, I think we'll plow through it just fine. So did I, today we're going to start talking about um, planting cool season vegetables at your home. And let's just go ahead and dive in. So some of the things you're going to need to know is what vegetables can you grow here at what times of year? Because we are seasonal, even though it doesn't seem like it. Some plants are not going to do well in the winter because they're not, they don't have enough uh, growing time. They don't have enough daylight. They need um, some more temperature to go. And then others do quite well because they get that little bit of cold at night that is what they need. Some of the things you'll need to know is where you're going to get your plant material at, what kind of tools you might need. Planning your garden is really important as a soil preparation. Um, if you want to plant a seed or a transplant, the mulching, some of the things you're going to need to do to help keep that soil moist, irrigating, fertilization, some pest control, and then harvest and enjoy it. So let's start with what vegetables you can grow here in the Coachella Valley. Um, one of the best ways to go about that is actually check our crop report because it gives you an idea of what the cool season vegetables are. And you can find that on our website at www.cvwd.org. So some of the perennials that we have going out here, um, a perennial obviously is a plant that takes multiple seasons to grow. Asparagus, for example, actually takes three years to get to that where you are able to eat it. Um, but so uh, some of the things are artichokes, asparagus, and rhubarb. These are basically edible ornamentals. You plant them once, and theoretically, they last forever. Um, asparagus can make it, there are only a few asparagus that can make it through our summer. That's part of the drawback here. Artichokes and rhubarb um, are considered cool season annuals. That's basically when you're going to harvest them. Bermuda grass often invades asparagus beds out here. And aphids love artichokes. So that's something that you have to keep an eye on. But a characteristic of a cool season vegetable, basically they're frost tolerant. Now I know we don't get a whole lot of that in some areas of our valley, but some areas we actually do, especially more on the southern end of it. Um, it's a root stalk or a leaf with an immature inflorescence or basically a flower. And it's got a shorter growing season, anywhere from 35 to 75 days. You're going to plant these anywhere between September and February. When you start getting toward the end of February, you start having some issues because as you saw just last week, we have heat waves that kind of come through and sometimes that can really be detrimental to some of these plants. But um, these are the vegetables basically your mom made you eat. So um, bolting. Bolting is basically when that plant actually goes to flower. As soon as they go to flower, they're pretty bitter. You're not going to want to eat them. Um, your January, February vegetable plantings should be a slow bolt variety. So there's different things you need to look for in your packaging and different places you can buy them. You know, any of these things that when you're buying seeds and stuff, you want to look for a short season variety. When in doubt as to whether it's a harvest, a spring cool season vegetable or not, go ahead and harvest it because if you wait too long, it's actually going to, um, it's going to get bitter on you and it's going to bolt. Some of the vegetable root crops we have are beets, 
carrots, onions, parsnip, radish, rutabaga, turnip, any of those type of root vegetables. Those yield the highest, uh, they have the highest yield per square foot of any other grown vegetable out here. Celery is a stock group, crop, group, stock crop, and it needs to be blanched near maturity. Basically, you have to pile up the soil around the base. Otherwise, it's going to start folding over and um, it's not going to keep those stalks nice and tight. And those tighter ones actually cut off some of that sunlight. So that's a good thing for You'll see those more tender stalks are on the inside. The leaf crops we've got going, um, you've got, you know, your lettuce, spinach, switch chard, all those types of things. Head lettuce doesn't do real good out here. And we're not sure if it's because of the lighter soils or what the deal is, but it's not one of the better ones. You want more of those leafy crops out here. The coal crops, you've got, you know, your broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, Calabrian kale. Um, these are big plants. They get quite large. These you're actually going to want to plant a complete fertilizer with NPK. Um, and you're going to want to have to side dress them a couple times with nitrogen. They also need to be blanched by covering with the outer leaves, though, to protect that inner fruit. I know personally I've done Brussels sprouts a couple times. I've only had success like once. Um, they tend to bolt pretty easy, especially as we get that warmer stuff. And I found I had to plant them pretty early on, like September type thing, to get it through to that cool season. So um, just kind of keep an eye on that. Like I said, it's, some of them can be difficult, and it's trial and error on a lot of this stuff. So the cool season legume, basically you're looking at your beans. Uh, they have a symbiotic with, uh, the relationship with soil. So basically they take in the nitrogen, and they trade that nitrogen with the plant sugar. So they trade it out. And it's a soil fixation. It's a nitrogen fixing in the soil. And this is a really good thing. So this is a great thing to rotate with your crop. Um, some of the legumes, and I didn't even realize this, honestly, that alfalfa and clover are legumes. Mesquite trees, that I knew. You can kind of see that when you're looking at the pictures there. That middle one is mesquite. And as you can see, it's quite similar to the beans because they're from the Baceae family, the bean family. So on the vegetable side, we've got peas, which are the cool season, and the beans, which are the warm season. Um, they don't require nitrogen throughout, as some of your other plants are going to, but they, it's really good to buy an inoculant in the beginning and coat that seed. And what that inoculant is, it's basically a booster, and it's the bacteria that I was telling you about that actually does that exchange, that um, nitrogen exchange with the plant, so it just gives it a head start. The bacteria is already there. It's not having to come out and search out that plant. So it just gives it a nice head start. So we're start talking about some of those things on where we get our plant material. So you can, you know, get any, any of your big box stores and your nurseries, but a lot of times the selection is limited and oftentimes they aren't in the same seasons as we are. So they're going to send stuff out that may not be proper for the Coachella Valley. So instead use an online source. Um, there's a whole bunch, and they have a ton of selection. You can find pretty much anything you want online. They also have open pollinated heirloom. So the heirlooms are basically any of those plants that are like usually 50 years or older without any changes. Some of the problems you have with heirloom, though, is they may not be disease resistant to something. So just kind of keep an eye on that. There's also non-GMO and non-treated seeds. Uh, some of the places you can get these are like Johnny's Selected Seeds, Baker's Creek and Heirloom Seeds. And then I found this one the other day that I'm actually having fun with. It's called um, Urban Organic Farmers, and it's a monthly subscription. And you can do two different ones, and I'm just doing the $5 one. But they send you, and you don't get to pick what you want is the only bad thing, but they usually send you stuff that you're interested in because you, you do like a little survey in the beginning. And they also send things that are proper for the season. But I think I get um, two packages of seeds, and then they give you the little seed starters for five bucks a month, free shipping. It's it's pretty cool, and it's fun. I get I see the little thing come in, and they even give you a handwritten note, which is kind of a nice little touch. So it's pretty cool. But for transplanting veggies, you know what? Get a seedling growth kit and start your own, because then you know what's going on. You know that there's not pesticides added to it. There's a lot of pluses to that. Now, don't get me wrong, I've been lazy and I've gone out and, you know, there's times I've, oh, gosh, that plant looks great, and I'll grab it and I'll uh, 
throw it in the garden, but I tend to have better success when I start my own, long-term success. So some of the tools you might need on some of these things, you might need a spading fork to help mix some of that soil. I'm really bad, I tend to use my hands a lot, but um, I also don't have my nails done, I don't have any of that sort of thing, so if you don't care what your hands look like, use your hands, it's probably one of the best tools. But then there's also times where it's too difficult to actually um, use your hands to dig in some soils, so some of these things are really helpful. Those seedling growing kits, those are great. Um, basically, they have a biodegradable outside and it's just got the little um, soil in it. You pop it in some water, it grows, and then you put your seeds in. I've also used eggshells. You can use toilet paper rolls, old toilet paper rolls, because those will break down. There's a lot of different things you can use for um, seed starting. A planting stick, so basically what a planting stick is, is that let's say you want your plants 18 inches apart. You're just going to get a stick and you're going to mark 18 inches. That way you don't have to sit out there every time and try and figure out how much it is. You just have it marked already. So you can put multiple marks on there as well. You can use that same stick, obviously, almost like you would a yardstick, and just that way you have your marks set up. A bulb planter, so that's good if you're especially doing transplants or bigger bulbs. And I'll show you one of these. It basically just kind of pulls the soil right out for you. Only thing about that sometimes, especially in your soil, if it's a clay soil, you're going to get slick sides on that. So I would prefer seeing you kind of um, stir that up a little bit. But you're going to amend your soil before you start anyway. So Knee pads, uh, that definitely helps for prolonged kneeling. Also, some of those little stools can be quite helpful. A pole and a um, hand hula hoe. I don't have one of those. I have, I have the pole one. I don't have the hand one. But those are pretty good for weeding. Very good for weeding, actually. Minimum maximum thermometer for frost, so you can kind of get an idea how cold it is. And a soil thermometer really helps when you're trying to germinate seeds, especially if you're doing it in the ground, because you know what that temperature actually is. Some of these plants aren't going to take off without the right soil temperature. So going into soil preparation, locate a good site. You want something with full sun at least six to eight hours a day. Kind of hard in the winter, and keep that in mind too. That sun, you're gonna, it's gonna shift in the winter time. So your shady, your sunny location may be shaded come summertime, and vice versa. So this is something you kind of want to keep an eye on, so that you can set your garden up to try and get year-round sun. Um, you also want it close to water, especially down here. You don't want to be lugging water around. Preferably, you'd want it on a timer where you have automatic irrigation because especially if you want to go away for the weekend, down here, you, sometimes you can't do that because you need daily water oftentimes, especially in summer. Um, do you have a good site? If you don't have a good site, try growing in containers. Containers can be great and you can actually, there's some great books out there that talk about container gardening and how to grow some of these plants up instead of out because that's a huge, huge space saver. So when you go to prep your soil, kind of stake out your corners and then you're going to irrigate that whole area and check and see what kind of drainage you have. You know, most of our soils here are fairly sandy, so we have pretty good drainage, but there are areas that have clay, and that may be something that you need to work with so that you can see what kind of drainage you have going on and how much you're going to have to actually amend. You want to remove any sort of weeds. Get that stuff out of there because you don't want that stuff popping up later. You're going to go ahead and top dress, but basically you're going to add a couple of inches of uh, organic soil amendment. Compost is amazing. You can actually get compost pretty cheap. Um, there's a place out past where the old dump used to be off Dillon Road on landfill. You can get a full truck road for $8.70 out there. So it's quite nice because you can get about, I don't know, 20 times the amount or more than what you would for the same price at a big box store. Um, once you do that, you're going to want to put a complete uh, fertilizer. A, a complete means it has all the necessities, the nitrogen, potassium, and, um, oh my gosh, I totally lost it. Anyway, <laughs> but you want a slow release. You don't want something, you want a pretty equal all the way around. So a lot of times a 4-4-4, 16-16-16 four, 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 works. There's different ones, but you can definitely, you want a slow release. 
Soil sulfur, if you have a high pH, which a lot of times we do down here because we are in a um, more of a alkaline soil out here, you, you can use some soil sulfur to help lower that. And a micronutrient fertilizer with iron and zinc, seaweed extract is a really good choice for that. So you want to mix into the soil with a spading fork or a rototiller. And you can see the before and after. You can kind of get that down into the, the ground because you've got some minerals down there you need to use as well. So planning your garden. It seems like a lot, but you kind of want to do the paperwork and you need to um, track stuff. It makes it easier down the road because your first couple years especially, it can, it can be frustrating sometimes. So figure out what you can grow now. So we have some handouts uh, that we're going to go ahead and load up for you. And one of the great ones on here is the Low Desert Planning and Harvest Calendar. This calendar is great because up in the left-hand side it has a legend. And it basically tells you what all the little X's and everything means. But for example, if we're looking at something such as, oh, let's see. Carrots. So carrots, according to the legend, it's a good planting time right now. And it tells you January 1st, 15th. It breaks each down, each month down by the 1st and the 15th. And it looks like carrots planting all the way up through the middle of February. Then it tells you when the harvest is. And again, that's on that legend. You'll see it. And it shows basically you can harvest up all the way through the end of May. But anyway, it's a pretty easy... Um, Thing to follow. It's really good for the low desert. They've got it narrowed down. One of the things that we have down here is we actually have shorter growing seasons than people realize because of those sudden shifts in weather. So this is a wonderful thing to go ahead and use and um, get you going on that. One of the things you might want to consider also, it works really well, is companion planting. So rather than having a monoculture or basically all the same plant in one area. If you mix stuff up, that's going to really help pests and it's also going to help with your crop rotation. Some plants do better with each other than they do with others. This one breaks it down pretty good and it tells you straight out what plants, who are the good companions, and who are the bad companions. And so it's pretty basic. There's a lot of different ones out there. I just like this one because it basically takes all of the, the staples, if you will, of the vegetable world and kind of breaks down what's good and what's bad to grow with each other. So companion planting and square foot gardening kind of go hand in hand, really. Um, and you don't have to do it, but it's really kind of a, a good idea because you, you break your beds down into square feet. And then this chart tells you basically how many plants of each type you can put in each square foot. So for example, radishes, you can put 16 plants in a square foot. Probably didn't know that, huh? So anyway, it kind of gives you an idea, but you know, you could basically put some radishes and some bush beans all in the same bed if those go well together. Actually, radishes and carrots do that, I know. Um, and that will really give you a great diversity and again it'll help with the bugs. One of the things too is your where are you going to put stuff? You might want to plan that out before you just start popping stuff in the ground. So I threw an example in here of one that I had found and it kind of gives you an idea of you know what you might put in containers or you, you just kind of map stuff out. Hey am I going to put a trellis over here? Am I going to grow peas up? Um, what side would I want that trellis on? So it gives you an idea for future and as you're going now to go ahead and um, map stuff out. Once you do that, you want to keep that for next year. But one of the things too you want to think about is succession planning. And what that is is basically, let's say, you know, you, you're growing some carrots. Well, do you want all your carrots, you know, in one harvest? Or do you want to kind of spread that out a little so that you have carrots today and then maybe in two weeks you've got some more developing and ready to harvest? So sometimes you're going to want to plant some stuff, wait a couple weeks, and plant more of the same thing. 
It doesn't have necessarily have to be next to each other. That's what's great about like the companion and square foot gardening. You could use another bed. But that way, again, you're going to have your harvest longer and you're not going to get a ton of fruit or vegetables all at one time. It's going to be spread throughout so you can actually utilize it. So as you do this and you keep notes on when you're planning things and everything else, keep that map and also use that to practice crop rotation for the following growing season because that is really important to keep healthy soils and to help uh, disease resistance. Oh, we already did that one. Did I? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Had some things happen here. So planting seeds and transplants. Don't do this. Don't take all your seeds and kind of put them all on one side or you know, put it all close together. If your package says plant every two inches and then thin as they grow to every four inches, start at every four inches. You can always fill some more in. That way you're not sitting there pulling transplants constantly or um, pulling a bunch of your, your babies out. You can actually spread them out a little thinner once in the beginning and then fill in as you go. So transplanting, they do make fertilizers just for transplanting. And they, that's that gadget I was telling you about for making the hole. You basically put it in there and it pulls the whole soil out when you squeeze it together. It's, it's kind of like a post hole digger, only handheld size. Again, with these, just kind of watch that you don't get slick edges so that those roots can actually expand out. But again, with most of our soils here, and if you've prepped your soil, that shouldn't be an issue at all. Mulching is really big. Um, it really helps conserve water. And then as your mulching material breaks down, it's going to add organics as well. So this also smothers those weeds. I know we pulled weeds out, but there's always remnants of weeds everywhere. So as you go ahead and mulch, it's going to um, help your soil stay cool in the summer, and then it's going to help it stay warm in the winter. It's also going to protect against any frost. So this is a really good way to um, to help conserve water and help your plants thrive. So talking about water and irrigation, um, it can be super difficult to irrigate efficiently when you have multi uh, poly, a polyculture going on. Basically, you have a bunch of different species in the same location. And those plants may have different type water needs. Your plants are always changing in size as well because they're starting as babies and then as they get bigger, they're going to require more water. And then the weather changes. So again, like last week, all of a sudden we had almost 90 degree days in January. You think your plants might need a little extra water? That's something that you're really going to need to take into consideration and keep an eye on. So the solution to this is, you know, rather than put a bunch of different valves in there and, and put a bunch of different irrigation, you irrigate the garden soil, not the individual plants. So you're going to basically irrigate to that whole bed. You're going to go ahead and test the soil when it kind of looks dry and grab a handful of it from the top couple inches and squeeze it into a ball and see if it stays in a ball or does it crumble. You know, when you roll it around, does it kind of crumble? If it's crumbling, <clears throat> it's time to irrigate. How long? Well, I get that question all the time, and that was really dependent on, for one, your irrigation system, um, how close things are irrigate, you know, how, how close your, if you have emitters, how close they are together. There's all kinds of different things. But you can do a real simple test with like some tuna cans to find out how long it takes you to get one inch of water into the ground. So you basically take those little cans out there, and whether you have spray, emitters, whatever, you run your system so you get about an inch of water. Time it so you know. <laughs> you don't want to do this multiple times. But, you know, like a uh, sprinkler system, you know, it may only take you five minutes to get that water down. Drip system may take you an hour. So those are the things you need to look at and kind of have an idea. Keep an eye on that soil. You know, like I said, when you start seeing it dry out, check it. And then that'll kind of give you an idea. You know, let's say you're checking it right now. Okay, it took three days for that to dry out to where I couldn't form a ball. Now you know right now you need to irrigate about every three days. Well, as we start heating up, though, in a little bit coming towards summer, 
check it more often because you might need to cut that back to two days. You know what I mean? There's different things you can do. You get a nice good rain in there, you might be able to turn that irrigation off for a week. It really depends. So it, again, you want to kind of keep an eye on things, especially if you want good yield out of your garden. So fertilization. That soil prep you did in the beginning is going to be good for pretty much most vegetables. However, if you've got corn, um, what we were talking about earlier, we we're talking about cabbage and stuff like that, they're heavier feeders. So with those, you're going to do something where you're going to side dress in between the rows kind of midway through. Or if you see signs of nutrient deficiency, if you're having yellowing of leaves or anything like that, you're going to want to head, go ahead and give those plants a little bit more boost. So side dressing, what you're going to do is you're going to make a shallow furrow six to eight inches from the base of your plant, and you're going to apply the fertilizer as per the label directs. This is one of those cases where more is better. No, go by the actual directions because you can actually be detrimental to your plants by giving them too much as well. Um, so once you apply that fertilizer, fertilizer go ahead and refill the, fur the furrow and then water it in. So side dressing is really good, especially for like spray irrigation. Sometimes it may not be necessarily as good with a drip irrigation unless you're getting nice even distribution of um, water throughout that soil. So in that situation, you know, you may look at a foliar feeding with a hose sprayer. The only thing I want to say about this is be really careful because some plants don't like water on their leaves and it's not good for them, such as tomatoes. So kind of do a little research before you go out there and just blast your plants because uh, it may not, they may not necessarily like it and they may not respond real well. So pest control, this is something, I mean, we could have a whole course on this, no problem. The main insects we deal with here are caterpillars, especially cabbage loopers and tomato hornworms, and aphids. Those are the two biggies that we really deal with. The cabbage looper and other caterpillars use BT. It's actually a natural um, insecticide. Basically, what I would do too, remember I was telling you sometimes I would see a plant that I'd really like, like a tomato plant that looked pretty good. As soon as I got it home, I found if I went ahead and hit it with BT and then planted it, I also had better success without those hornworms coming. Rather than waiting until I had an infestation and applying it, I kind of pre-set it up to not get them. Aphids, aphids, basically you're going to want to spray it with an insecticidal soap or Dawn. Dawn works just fine as well. Kind of shake that stuff up, spray it on there, and it's going to help knock those aphids down. But before you go start grabbing stuff, you want to also know what other pests you have out there, which may not actually be pests. But before we go into that, actually I have a few pictures here for you of the cabbage looper. When I first started seeing my cabbage get these huge holes in it, I was thinking I was going to find these massive worms. They're tiny. These are little bitty things that you can barely see. And of course, it's the moth at night that lays the eggs for them. And as you can see with that one picture, um, even though the worms are tiny and the eggs are tiny, they, they can do quite a bit of damage. Aphids, aphids actually come in a variety of colors. Um, they, what aphids do is they sh tend to get on the underneath of that leaf. They start sucking. They're a sucking uh, predator, not a predator. They're a sucking bug. But sometimes aphids, you may not see them, but you may see a bunch of ants either at the base of your plant or on your plant. What ants do is they actually harvest the honeydew that the uh, aphids leave. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at that picture at the very bottom, you can see the ant literally drinking that honeydew right out of that aphid. So they will actually corral them, and they'll keep them in one area so that they can feed off of their honeydew. So if you see a bunch of ants, kind of keep an eye out because you probably likely have aphids in there. But what I was getting at is know your bugs. Not all bugs are bad. That big ugly one on the top, that's actually a ladybug. And that big ugly one on the top, that's the larvae, and they eat more aphids than the ladybugs do. This one's really hard to see, but if you see, you're thinking, oh man, I got all these eggs, I, I have a cabbage looper, I have something. 
keep an eye on. Actually look at the way those eggs are laid. If you look closely, you can see they're actually kind of raised up. They're on a little stem. That's a green lacewing. Lacewings also are great predators when they eat um, aphids. So keep an eye. Not all your bugs are bad. These things, I'm thinking, what is this? First time I saw those, I was like, what are these crazy things? And then you see this come out. It's like, oh, good Lord, what is that? It's actually a, a praying mantis. And praying mantis are one of the best predators we have in our garden. So again, kind of get an idea. Know your bugs. Learn what bugs you have. Learn what their larvae look like. Because again, their larvae may not look anything like what the adult does. But it could be doing quite well in your garden. And you may not even need to spray anything if you have good diversity going. Mason bees are another really big thing that are good out here. Mason bees are a native bee. They're native to your area, and they're found pretty much anywhere. And you can encourage them to come in just by putting a drilled out piece of wood. You don't want to use treated wood. But what they do is they actually go in, and they lay their eggs in there. They seal it over with mud, and then when the season hits, the new uh, bees come out. They don't form hives like honeybees. They are single predators. Uh, single solitary bees, and like I said, they'll go in, they take some mud, they go in there, lay their eggs, they seal it off, and they do this until that thing's full. What's really cool is I bought a house a couple years ago, and one of our colleagues, Don Ackley, um, gave me a bee barn. He actually picked this up at Costco, and it, you know, it has room for the bees, has room for butterflies, everything else, but I've hung it up, and I've actually had mason bees. They found it quite right away. And uh, each year I've had more and more come, so it's pretty cool. I've not seen any butterflies in that top part, but it's still pretty neat seeing the bees out there. And again, that's what helps pollinate. So I encourage the bees. So diseases, again, this kind of goes along with pest control. Again, this could be a whole course, but I barely touched on this. Um, Generally, by the time a vegetable disease reveals its symptoms, it's going to be too late to even save the plant. The best response is to immediately pull the sick plant out and get rid of it. Put it in a bag of some sort, whatever, but get, throw it in the trash. Don't compost it either. You don't want to um, promote bringing that sort of disease into your compost. Um, don't leave it in the garden because you don't want that stuff spreading. Remember where it manifested itself. So that's where that map is going to come in really handy as well because you can, you know, make notes on it and do crop rotation that we talked about. So, for example, if you had tomatoes in this bed, plant carrots there next time and move the tomatoes to another bed when you're ready to plant them again. That really helps, again, keep the disease down and it helps with your soil because different plants require different nutrients. So they may be, you know, you're... Tomatoes may be pulling a different nutrient than the carrots. As you do that rotation, you're not going to strip all of those nutrients out of that soil. It's going to be a more even distribution. This is just, I found this and I thought it was kind of cool because it gives you different ideas on each leaf of what the uh, disease could be. So, you know, just looking at this, you can see that third one up, powdery mildew. That's kind of an idea what it looks like. Uh, white fly or, you know, what rust looks like. So this gives you an idea of what the disease may be. Harvesting and storing. When you start getting into harvesting, one of the things we found out is that um, picking vegetables early in the morning actually gives you best flavor. Don't wait until the afternoon. I mean, you can, but they just tend to have better flavor, I guess, from sitting all night and relaxing. Um, keep your vegetables fresh. You don't necessarily want to refrigerate everything. Some things don't do as well refrigerated. Tomatoes flavors are better if you leave them out. Granted, they won't last as long sometimes, but you're picking them because you want to eat them fresh to begin with, not store them. So just keep that in mind. Kind of, again, do a little bit of research. See what time or, um, you know, um, where the best place to store your vegetables likely is. There are tons and tons and tons of books out there. Um, I didn't bring all my books. I just, I just brought a couple. And honestly, a bunch of my books were at home that I didn't realize. I thought I had them here. But that Square Foot Gardening one, that's really good. And the Great Garden Companions, I love both of those. But they have ones on vertical gardening, 
The good bug, bad bug is great because it gives you different pictures and you can kind of see stuff. Um, I've got one here, the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Insect and Disease Control. So that one also is really good on learning the different, um, the predators and the actual bad bugs. Of course, we have our Lush and Efficient, and there's different information in there on gardening. Not overly detailed, but it'll give you a nice, good basis. One I found, oh, you know what? I actually found this at a, um, a library. And a lot of the libraries you go to, I don't know if the libraries are even open right now with COVID, but they would have a room that was just sales on books. And I think I got this book for like a quarter. It's an older book. And it's by George uh, Brookbank, but it's desert gardening, and it has some amazing information. And the pictures are black and white, and it's a little dated, but some of that information still holds very, very true today. So if you can find it, and you might be able to find it online super cheap, it's definitely worth looking at. So again, just go through, and a lot of these different books, you know, you can buy them used for very cheap. They might be a little worn, but... It's really good information, and I go to my books a lot. I go to my books a whole lot. So I actually wrapped that up fairly quickly. I know I went through that fast, but that gives us plenty of time for questions. So I don't know, Steph, do we have anything? There's not any questions at the time in the chat box, but if anybody has any questions to ask Andrew, questions in chat box. We were able to get all of the handouts uploaded. We did have a few. I will. Eat. She's dead. She's dead. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate you attending today. And um, we hope to see you on the next one, which is February 17th, same time, 11 a.m. So thank you so very much. You have a wonderful day. I need me help you. I do, I do. I always forget to look at it. I'm done.